Okay. Good morning. This is for me a big pleasure to uh, chair the, the talk given by Alfio Quarteroni. Alfio is a professor of numerical analysis at the Politecnico di Milano since uh, 1989. He's a specialist in mathematical modeling, numerical analysis, scientific computing, with applications to fluid uh, mechanics, environment, geophysics, medicine, and the improvement of sports performance. He is the director of the Chair of Modeling and Scientific Computing. Uh, he has been <laughs> director at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland from 1998 to 2017. He is the founder and was the first director of Moxos, a spin off company at Politecnico di Milano. Uh, founded in 2000, uh, 2010. Uh, he's also founder of the Institute or Research Center Matixet, also, at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and of uh, MOX at Politecnico di Milan. He has been the advisor of 60 PhD theses, author of 22 books, some of them translated into up to seven languages, author of 350 papers published in scientific journals and conference proceedings. He's member of the editorial board of 25 international journals and editor-in-chief of two book series published by Springer. He has been invited or plenary speaker in more than 300 international conferences and academic departments and in particular, he has been plenary speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2006 in Madrid. He, he has the NASA Group Achievement Award for the pioneering work in computational fluid dynamics in 1992, the International Galileo Galilei Prize for Sciences in 2015, and what is for me more remarkable even, He's Dr. Honoris Causa in Naval Engineering from the University of Trieste. His research group at EPFL has contributed to the preliminary design of the Solar Impulse, the Swiss solar powered aircraft. His team also has carried out the mathematical simulation for the optimization of the Alinghi Yacht, which won two editions of the America's Cup in 2003 and 2007. He has been recipient of what well, he has been recipient of one RC Advances grant for the project Math Card in 2018 uh, 2008, two proof of uh, ERC proof of concept, and at present he is a recipient of another ERC Advanced grant for the project iHeart in 2017, which is the kernel of what I think he is talking about to, uh, now. iHeart represents one of the first attempts to create a complete mathematical model of the human heart, including all the implied physio physiological processes within the, let's say, fast developing framework of personalized medicine. So I think that in this subject, ROM and machine learning tools play a fundamental role besides physics based through mathematics description of the systems involved. So thank you very much, Alfio. Uh, good morning, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And uh, of course, thank you very much for inviting me. So this is the title of the talk and try to, to see at which extent we can uh, uh, prove that uh, uh, the separation barrier uh, between uh, the world of uh, uh, data science and the world of mathematical models uh, can be broken. So as you see in this picture, in the, in the upper part of the picture, uh, is the classical uh, way mathematical models are built up. You need data, few data, uh, just the right amount of data, and, uh, and then you have a model which is based on uh, several kinds of equations, 
And uh, typically those equations express um, principles of physics. And then you produce a solution and there may be an output, Y of U. Uh, on the lower part, uh, you have the classical uh, framework of, uh, uh, say, data-driven uh, uh, models. Uh, you have training data, couples of, uh, um, as you see, uh, elements. Uh, the I is a data and YI is the answer, uh, then, uh, or the output. Then you train, for instance, an artificial neural network, and uh, once you have this uh, uh, um, ANN trained, uh, you can use it uh, to uh, uh, find the output uh, corresponding to a new type of data. So apparently the two words are, uh, can, can, can move in a completely independent way, but in fact my message at the end of my, of my talk would be that uh, there's a lot of uh, potential and a lot of advantage in trying to consider them in a cooperative mode then, uh, rather than in a, in a, in a competitive mode. Uh, so, the leading application that I will consider is uh, that of uh, the mathematical heart, as uh, uh, Professor Chacon has mentioned before. So, here the idea is to reconstruct the uh, complete function of the heart. Now, I guess you all have uh, an idea of the way the heart function, uh, functions. Uh, it received um, venous blood, and uh, um, uh, this is from, uh, say, uh, the uh, um, vena cava. Uh, this blood enters into the right atrium and then it passes through this valve into the right ventricle, then it's pumped into this uh, um, pulmonary artery to the lungs where it releases CO2 and other toxic substances. It intakes oxygen, it brings it back to the uh, um, left part of the heart, the left atrium, and then through the left ventricle. And when the left ventricle squeezes, say, uh, the blood is ejected into the uh, ascending aorta and through the aorta to all the vital part of our body. So this is the pumping function of the heart. But why the heart does it pump? Well, this is because there is an electrical stimuli that is originated in a very specific place, which is called the sinoatrial node, and from there it originates an electrical field uh, which propagates through the upper part of the heart to the atria and afterward to the lower part of the heart and uh, through the Purkinje network which is this very fast highway network, it reaches all the cells of our myocardium. Now, there is a very complex mechanism that happens at the cell level that I have not the time to describe. There is the creation of an action potential, and, uh, and this is because of the fact that, this is due to the fact that there are ions, uh, channels that open and close, and allow the migration of ions from the inner part of, of the cell to the outer part of the cell. There is a creation of the uh, of a cell of a electric potential, uh, this uh, triggers the uh, formation of a wave, an electrical wave that propagates through all the cells, and uh, and because of that, the cardiomyocytes will contract and relax, and overall the muscle will myocardium will contract and relax, and of course you have blood inside, uh, so there is a further element which is fluid dynamics that takes place in this very complex mechanism. So uh, this is a conceptual view of. Uh, uh, the mathematical art, indeed. Uh, you see on the background there are four different chambers. Uh, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the right atrium, and the left atrium. And uh, over each chamber you see all the fundamental physical mechanisms that take place. And uh, uh, you see you have the electrophysiology, which has to see with the formation electrical field. You have the active and passive mechanics. The active force is the one that originates at every cardiomyocyte. The passive mechanics is the one that allows the heart to contract and to relax, say. Then uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, then we have, uh, uh, well, we have the fluid dynamics. Then you have uh, uh, the dynamics of the valves. And, and then, of course, you have the coupling between all these uh, elements in the four chambers and with external circulation, with the pulmonary circulation, the systemic circulation. So this is, um, say, mathematically speaking, a very complex system of uh, partial and, and ordinary differential equations, which are nonlinear and, uh, and strongly coupled together. Um, now, to see a bit more into the details, uh, uh, we, we call core cardiac models the different uh, core components of the physiology of the heart. So you see the electrophysiology, the active mechanics, the passive mechanics, the fluid dynamics, the vast motion, and the, and the myocardial perfusion. Um, now, 
If you go into the details, of course, we not make any effort to explain the way you derive these equations because, because of uh, sake of time, say, uh, but just to give you the idea of the type of mathematical problem that you end up with. Uh, you see, uh, for the electrophysiology, uh, you have uh, an equation which is a partial differential equation whose primary variable is u, uses the transfer brain potential, and this is what is called a nonlinear uh, reaction diffusion equation. It is coupled with another set of equations, which are of ordinary differential form, say, and those are responsible for the dynamics of uh, uh, the ionic species at the cell levels. As you can guess, uh, there is a coupling between the microscopic model and the macroscopic model. The microscopic at the cell level, the macroscopic is at the global level, the systemic level. Uh, once you solve those equations, you can reconstruct, for instance, the electric potential of the heart, as you can see here. Uh, so you have different colors. Uh, the blue is uh, part of, uh, say, the heart, which has not yet been uh, activated electrically, whereas the other color refers to uh, the different values of the, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in millivolt of the electric potential. So you originate uh, the electrical stimuli from uh, the upper part, as I was saying before, we see it now uh, at time zero, say, uh, and then it propagates to the upper part of the, of, the, um, uh, of the atrium and then to the lower part of the atrium. You see two different views. This one is a cross-section view. The, the left-hand uh, view is the one on the, on the external surface, on the epicardium of, uh, of the heart, say. Uh, as you can see, you can go much beyond the clinical images. You can get a dynamic view and uh, on top of that you have quantitative information, you have values. Uh, corresponding to the different uh, um, points. Uh, here is the same simulation, but uh, from a different perspective. You see the propagating front on the right-hand side. And uh, on the left-hand side, you see the isolines. Uh, these are the isolines that connect those points that are reached electrically at the same time instant. So this is called the activation map, and is what, uh, say, arithmologists uh, uh, use uh, to uh, decide whether or not a heart is functioning correctly from the electrical viewpoint. Uh, once you have those, mo those models, and of course if you trust them, you can use them in clinical practice. As you can see here, uh, this is a ventricle of a real patient, uh, which is affected by kind of severe scars, so it has been infarcted. So you have scars, which means uh, places uh, that do not c communicate. Uh, that do not conduct electrically any longer. And uh, so you have the formation of a very irregular pattern of waves that uh, uh, interact one another and originate what is called sometimes an electrical chaos. Uh, so in those cases, you have to ablate, uh, meaning that you have to find specific points and then burning those points um, in order to interrupt this irregular path. And what we're trying to do is to help doctors to find the optimal places of those um, points where they have to ablate. Uh, now, uh, these are the electrophysiology part, and then the heart beats, and it beats because you have a contraction and a dilation um, of the muscle. So you have to couple this electrophysiology system that I uh, 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 recalled in the upper part of the slide with the lower part where you have the active mechanics uh, namely the deformation of every single cardiomyofilament uh, and uh, the passive mechanics, which, is, uh, uh, which provides us with the deformation of the whole uh, um, cardiac muscle. And this is an elastodynamic equation. Uh, of course, it's a nonlinear equation because of a nonlinear constitutive law that we are considering. And again, this is a coupled system of equations. Now, if you solve it, uh, you can have a realistic, complete picture of the heartbeat. So you see the heart. On the right-hand side picture, you see the deformation. Um, you go up to two centimeters of deformation. Um, uh, so it's a microscopic deformation indeed. On the, uh, uh, in, in this part here, what you see is the concentration of the calcium ions during the heartbeat. And uh, what you see here is uh, uh, the distribution of the cell fibers, uh, of the cardiac fibers. Uh, and I will get back on that. Uh, later on when we talk about data, say. So this is a very realistic simulation. It takes an uh, order of a few days on a very big supercomputer, one of the biggest at the European scale, to simulate just one heartbeat. And, and this calls for uh, using, uh, uh, say, 
um, machine learning techniques uh, to speed up this type of simulation. Then we have the fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics means that we have uh, blood flow into the, uh, the chambers, and uh, we need equations for that. And those equations are typically the Navier-Stokes equations for incompressible viscous fluids. Uh, uh, the, um, the, the tricky point here is that those equations hold in a domain that is moving in time in an unknown way. So we have to modify slightly the Navier-Stokes equations to account for this motion. And, uh, and on top of that, to account for the presence of the valves. So the valves are simulated, they are opening and closing, and, uh, and by that uh, you can end up with, uh, again, trying to see what's happening in the, uh, within the heart. Uh, this is the left heart. So you have, uh, say, the atrium, and then the ventricle, and then the aorta. So blood is entering here from uh, uh, the lungs, then it passes through this valve, which is called the mitral valve, when it opens. It enters into the lower part, which is the, 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 the ventri left ventricle. And then, when the pressure is high enough to win the resistance of the aortic valve, it enters into the aortic valve, and it, gets, uh, it reaches all the, the cells of our body, say. So, you see here the velocity field, uh, the pressure field, and uh, uh, you have the coherent structures that are formed uh, during the heartbeat. Uh, so this calls for uh, an investigation of the turbulent properties of, uh, of, uh, of blood into the ventricle and indeed in a physiological heart, uh, so in a healthy heart, uh, uh, you, you do not have turbulent behavior, uh, although uh, you have a permanent transition, a continuous transition toward the turbulent. So it's very difficult to simulate uh, numerically. You need, you need say, uh, a turbulence model to close the Navier-Stokes equations to do that. Now, uh, the heart is not in the middle of nowhere, it is in the middle of the external circulation. Uh, that's why you need to connect it with the external environment. External environment means that uh, you have to connect it with the rest of the circulation, which is made of uh, tens, sorry, hundreds of uh, large arteries and uh, a thousand of medium-sized arteries and billions of capillaries. So it's unrealistic to use three-dimensional analysis for all these uh, uh, components. Uh, that's why we use a zero-dimensional analysis, which means, that, which means that we use ordinary differential equations to mimic uh, the external circulation as if it were uh, made by um, electrical circuits, say. So um, uh, our, our heart is indeed embedded into the rest of the circulation with a suitable, um, uh, suitably coupled system. Uh, by that, we can simulate the four chambers of the heart, uh, this is a very new uh, kind of simulation that uh, uh, we ended up with. Uh, you, you see um, the uh, different colors, and uh, this is because you see the velocity in the left part of the heart uh, is much higher than in, uh, uh, in, the, um, in the right part of the heart. So you see the heart beating with the four chambers and with the connection with the pulmonary veins and uh, with the aorta. Um, and uh, once you rely on this type of simulation, you can use it in a, a clinical environment. For instance, in this case, we see the way uh, we can uh, simulate the so-called mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is due to the fact that one of the valves, the mitral valve, does not close perfectly well uh, during the contraction, uh, uh, which is called um, uh, the, um, say, when you have the, the, the uh, the, the, the left part of the heart is contracting. Uh, th that means that part of the blood, which is in the, the left ventricle, uh, goes back into the uh, left atrium, and this is unphysiological, of course. So you have to repair the situation uh, because it will produce eventually an irregular behavior of the heart, and, uh, and fluid dynamics uh, uh, inspection helps understanding the way you can repair those type of valves. Um, now, uh, we, we have been applying this type of uh, models to uh, better understand the consequences of the COVID-19. Uh, in particular, we have been uh, uh, simulating uh, a, an increase of pulmonary resistance, uh, which is typically due to the, to the alteration of uh, the parenchyma in the, in the lungs uh, uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 uh, contagion, a decrease ox oxygen saturation and, uh, and an increased heart rate, and we are trying to 
figure out the way uh, uh, those curves that are very well known by the clinicians, those are called the PV loops, uh, PV loops. Uh, those are the uh, P stands for pressure, V stands for, for uh, volume, uh, and then describe the relation between the variation of the volume of the ventricle and the variation of the pressure in the ventricle, the way this PV loop change dramatically during uh, uh, COVID-19 attacks, say. And, uh, and we do that with uh, a couple of hospitals in Milan, which, which, which have really uh, been uh, at the, uh, I would say, hypocenter of, uh, of the seismic uh, uh, perturbation that you had due to COVID-19 in, uh, in the past year, say. Uh, now, to, to be even more realistically at the modeling level, uh, we should be able to um, account for uh, the change of the ATP. The ATP is the adenosine triphosphate, uh, and which is the most relevant trigger of the uh, cardiomyocyte contraction. And for that, we should be able to connect the old mathematical model for the heart with the metabo metabolism and uh, with the and, uh, and with the uh, say the dynamics of the oxygen transportation, uh, which means that we have to connect the heart with the lungs. So this is a kind of holistic model that goes beyond the model of the heart, which is already by itself quite complicated, which uh, would be, however, necessary if you really want to account for the alteration that is due, for instance, to the COVID attack. Okay, data. Where are data coming from in this case? Um, well, we are talking about heart, so we're talking about people, patients, uh, so data come from uh, primarily from medical images, not only from there, but primarily from medical images. And uh, medical imaging, at the medical imaging level, we have a different type of modality. We have CT scan, we have MRI, we have CineMRI, uh, many different, uh, say, declinations. And, uh, and, and, and we use uh, different type of images to end up with different type of data that will be needed to feed our models. Um, for instance, we use a CT scan, if available, and please note that this uh, uh, remark, if available, is, is crucial because uh, not uh, always you have all the data that you need mathematically. When they are available, you can use them to reconstruct shapes, ventricle and coronary reconstruction. So CT scans are, 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 are perfectly suited to allow us to reconstruct shapes. Uh, MRI, uh, we use them, in particular CineMRI, uh, which means uh, 4D MRI. Uh, we, we, they, they are used to, to create left ventricle shape and motion. So to uh, reconstruct the motion, the external motion of, of the ventricle. And we use um, a late gadolinium enhancement MRI uh, to uh, find out the scar regions. If a heart has been... Uh, um, say, hit by an infarct, for instance, uh, then there are regions uh, which are the red regions here that do not uh, conduct the electricity any longer, so they are dead, basically. And then you have the blue regions, which are the healthy part of the heart, of the ventricle, and then you have the gray zones, which is a kind of intermediate region. So, sorry, you, we use LGE MRI, if available, to uh, uh, find out where those scars regions are. And uh, obviously, uh, those are very important if you want to simulate um, uh, numerically what's happening. Now, once you have the shape, uh, we have invariably to use uh, numerical methods to solve the problem and cause. Forget about having, uh, uh, say, exact solutions of our equations. So we have to use numerical methods. To use numerical methods, we need a grid, namely you have to end up with uh, a finite dimensional representation of the geometry with elementary shapes. It could be hexahedra or tetrahedra, and, uh, and the number of hexahedra or tetrahedra is strictly related with uh, the accuracy that you should expect from our computation. Of course, the higher the number of uh, elements, uh, uh, the um, uh, heavier the computation. So it's always it's, it's a, it's a matter of compromise between uh, accuracy and uh, complexity. Um, there is another issue, though, uh, which is very important and still is about data. Um, now, not, uh, I told you before that not always we have the necessary data 
to make our computations. Um, uh, those data are originated from people, from patients. So one uh, example is provided by the fibers, uh, by the cardiac fibers. Uh, the cardiac fibers are very important uh, because they are responsible of two fundamental physical processes. One is, as I told you before already, uh, that through the cardiac fibers uh, you have the conduction of the electrical stimuli. Uh, so these are very fast highways that allow the electrical stimuli to reach all the regions of our uh, myocardium. But then uh, there is another very fundamental role uh, which is played by the uh, fibers and is the torsion of the heart. At every heartbeat, our heart uh, shrinks, it uh, thickens, and uh, it undergoes a very severe torsion. Now, the torsion is allowed, is, is made possible by the presence of the fibers. So if you do not know the fiber distribution, uh, uh, it, you, 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 you get in a trouble in the sense that it's very hard then uh, to provide realistic information. And unfortunately, uh, you do not have fiber distribution from clinical images. So you only have a partial information and you have to reconstruct them. And to reconstruct them use, uh, which might seem a par paradox, you need partial differential equations to reconstruct data. So this is yet another place where PDEs and data analysis uh, show a very strong interplay. So we have a very partial information on the fibers. Uh, we use PD analysis. Uh, we compute geodesics uh, to reconstruct basically the, the fibers distribution. And we end up with this type of information which is crucial. You see, this is the way uh, the fiber orientation change, uh, changes uh, when you go from the epicardial surface, which means the external surface of the heart, to the endocardial surface, which is the, which is the innermost uh, membrane of, uh, of, of the myocardium. Of course, this transmural change is simulated by the solution of specific PDEs, uh, which are then uh, uh, essential to reconstruct the fiber distribution. So this is about then data which are necessary to feed the partial differential equations that I've been showing until now. Now, uh, this is the second part of my talk, data, and, uh, and data-driven modeling. So, so far you have seen models that are based on physical processes, a clear understanding of physical processes and their uh, translation into partial differential equations and their numerical simulations. Now, data. And, uh, and data-driven models. Well, let me first give you, uh, just for the sake of clarity, some, uh, 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 say, dictionary here. PDE, you all know what PDEs are, partially, partial, partial differential equations, which describe problems in engineering, life sciences, natural science, and finance. So, so far you have seen systems of coupled nonlinear PDEs. HF, HF stands for High Fidelity Numerical Solvers. When you need to solve PDEs, you use the best that you can do, the best possible numerical method you, you, are, uh, you have available, right? For instance, finite elements. Um, now, ANN, Artificial Neural Networks, those are architectures that are made of interconnected nodes that we call neurons, which can learn arbitrary complex input-output functions. This is their primary, I would say, uh, objective. And then we have ROM, ROM stands for reduced order models. Reduced order models are there to allow uh, the translation of high fidelity problems, which may consist of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of equations, into, um, say, simplified models, which consist of uh, hundreds of, say, thousands of equations that hopefully can be solved in real time. And we'll see that you are actually using machine learning dimensionality reduction techniques to go from high fidelity models that are generated by PDEs to, uh, 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 say, very reduced system uh, which uh, can be then um, um, solved in a very, very quick time. So ANN, I guess there is no real need to uh, recall what ANN are, but just to fix the notation, let me just say that ANN are structured like this, where you have uh, uh, layers of, uh, of nodes that we call neurons, and we have input nodes, output nodes, and uh, a few hidden layers. Um, you have uh, uh, what we call shallow network. Uh, you have seen yesterday in the presentation of, uh, of uh, Professor 
um, you and Bruna, uh, so shell, shell on a network uh, where uh, you just have one internal layer or say deep network when you have uh, very many internal layers. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you uh, are interested in simulating a transfer function or an input output function going from the input to the output. Let me call this phi. We go from Rn to Rm and phi is the composition of very different, of different, say, uh, a sequence of different functions. Tj are affine functions that depends on weights which are there to characterize the network and, uh, and uh, sigma uh, are nonlinear functions that are called activation functions. And here you see examples of activation function. Just to fix the ideas, you can think of, uh, say, either a sigmoid function or uh, uh, the hyperbolic tangent, say, or other functions like uh, the Brillou or, uh, or the leaky Rilu, say. Uh, basically, is a decision function. You go from 0 to 1 or to minus 1 to 1 in a, in a more or less regular way, say. So this is the transfer function, the input-output function, which is what an artificial neural network indeed does. And, uh, and of, of course, uh, we have uh, the issue of uh, deciding whether or not an artificial neural network is capable of approximating an arbitrary function. Remember that we want to simulate physical processes um, which, uh, uh, of a very diversified nature. So how general is a, a transfer function? the one that is based on, uh, on, on ANN. Uh, this is a very famous theorem by Sibenko that was cited yesterday by, by Joan Bruna. Um, and it, it, it tells us that if you have a sigmoidal continuous activation function, uh, then every C0 function uh, in the hypercube, say, uh, for any epsilon, for every f, uh, c0, and for every epsilon, uh, there exists a single layer, so a shallow artificial neural network, fn, such that the distance is less than epsilon for any x in the hypercube. So this is a density function, uh, a density theorem. Um, then, uh, uh, of course, uh, we care about uh, uh, the rate of convergence uh, so this is somehow the equivalent of the Weierstrass theorem for a C0 function in the case of, of course, not of polynomials, but of, uh, of uh, uh, artificial neural network. And then uh, this is a theorem, uh, is one of, uh, say, the earliest theorem in this, uh, in this field that say that if you, again, you consider sigmoidal activation function now in C infinity, so you have to have it very smooth, then um, uh, this is sigma in C infinity, then for every function in this uh, sober space, say, uh, for, any, uh, uh, for any epsilon uh, larger than zero, there exists a single layer, again, a shallow uh, artificial neural network, Fn, such that the difference is less than epsilon, and uh, uh, for any x in uh, Id, which is the hypercube, and you see here we are using N, uh, uh, Fn is uh, 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 somehow the dimension, of, uh, of uh, the neural network, and this n is order of epsilon, which is the accuracy which is demanded to the power minus d, which is the space dimension divided by the regularity k. And this is the regularity of the smoothness degree of the, say, the sober regularity of, uh, of f. Now you have similar results in Lipschitz spaces, sober spaces, and, uh, and for other type of artificial function. This is a list of uh, more recent results uh, of, uh, say, density nature. Now, we basically, in our application, consider two kinds of networks. Uh, the one which is fully connected, which is the one above. We have an input and an output. Uh, and, uh, and here, we use it for regression classification and, and for uh, function approximation. Uh, or we use autoencoders, so-called autoencoders, where you have an input and an output. We have an encoder first, uh, and with the encoder, we go from high dimension to low dimension. Then you have the code. In, in, uh, in between, uh, which is a low dimensional representation of the datum. So you, have, you go from high dimension to low dimension, you present the data, and then we, uh, we go the other way around with a decoder, and you go to the output. Basically, these are two, the two architectures that we are considering. So uh, physics-based and data-driven modeling. Uh, so the message that I would like to address is this one, to convey is this one. Uh, it's much better to have them to cooperate rather than seeing them in a competition, say. And, uh, uh, well, this is a statement that was uh, uh, somehow the, um, 
that is in included into a, a report uh, from Sime Review from 2016, uh, and uh, it tells us that the knowledge incorporated into a mathematical model is essential to make prediction outside the range of the training data set to account for variation of the system, uh, in particular what happens if you change the rules of the game, and to account for data variability, uh, missing data, um, noise, uh, noisy data, and, uh, and errors. And uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, example statement that is reported in this, uh, uh, in, in this article. They say that models based on first principles, uh, like those that have been showing at the beginning of my talk, the first part of my talk, are essential components of systems that extract valuable insights from massive data, insights that tend to go far beyond what can be recovered by black box statistical modeling alone. Of course, this is a point of view of someone coming from the uh, computational side, right? Modeling side, numerical mathematics. But I like really to try to see the way the two worlds can cooperate. This is one example. Um, first of all, I've shown you before the two uh, different areas. Uh, so uh, uh, those are typically called the uh, Y uh, model or the black model. The y, white model is the one that is based on physical principles. The black model is the one that is based on use of machine learning techniques or artificial neural network. Uh, now we talk about the gray zone, the, the way you can get the interplay between the two. This is one example. Uh, in, our numeric, in our mathematical model, you have some missing components at the modeling level. For instance, you do not know the constitutive equation that characterizes that specific material or that specific uh, biological tissue. Um, all right, so we use uh, artificial neural network, um, trained artificial neural network, to guess the constitutive relations. So in this case, we are using artificial neural network to improve the quality of the uh, mathematical model. Here is another example. Um, we want to compute a reduced model, reduced order model. You remember my definition before. And uh, to do that, uh, we use uh, training data, which are not obtained from experiments, but they are obtained from simulating offline uh, uh, with our high fidelity model. So with this training data, we compute an artificial neural network, which is then capable of uh, producing a reduced order model for the high fidelity model above. So in this case, the artificial neural network is just working to accelerate the computation of the high fidelity model. Um, uh, that's, this is another example. Uh, this is an example where the artificial neural network indeed learns the model, the physical model. So it's not capable of reproducing synthetically the equations. Forget about that, at least for the time being. But it's capable of reproducing the input-output function of a physical model. Um, very often you do not have data or you may miss parameters in your equation. For instance, uh, uh, you may have uh, uh, the electrical conducibility of the heart, which is not available. You do not have initial conditions. You do not have boundary conditions. That's very often the case in practical applications. And, and you go much beyond uh, the, the magic word of PDEs, right? Where invariably you have a computational domain, uh, you have your PDE and all the elements of our PDEs are known and you start from there. Indeed, this is a nightmare often in the applications because you do not have those elements. Can I reconstruct those elements? Well, you typically do it by parameter identification or by solving inverse problems. But this costs a lot in terms of a numerical solution. Can you use artificial neural network to help getting those type of information in a much, in a much quicker way? So we, we, we tend toward having a fusion between data and models. And uh, this is just a kind of a, a pictorial view of the way we see this fusion possible. We have physics-based models and you have a, a machine learning or data-driven models, say. Uh, now, physics-based models uh, uh, start from a mechanistic understanding and the principle of causality. Um, Machine learning is uh, instead based on correlations or digesting big amount of data. Um, you have indeed uh, very many ways the two words can communicate. 
Typically, you can use the physics-based model to regularize uh, the machine learning or artificial neural network model to avoid overfitting. You can augment data, already mentioned that you can provide synthetic data to train the network by solving the, 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 the physics-based model. On the other side, you have uh, model reduction, so the possibility of uh, using machine learning to extract models that have a much lower dimension or unveiling, uncovering constitutive laws that would not be available otherwise. So you're really enhancing the uh, physical capability of, uh, uh, so the, 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 the capability of um, mathematical models to describe the physics. Uh, or you may use them for parameter estimation, for sensitivity analysis, and for uncertainty quantification. Um, so it's, uh, it's a world that indeed is already very strongly interconnected. I mean, if you just look at it without any bias, you see that you can take a lot of advantage from fusing the two worlds together. Um, so one example is provided by the PIN, P-I-N-N, -N, standing for Physics in Four Neural Networks. It's just one example, but I would like to, to go a bit into the details to show the way this can be indeed uh, 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 realized. So the idea is that you want to approximate the solution of PDEs by means of artificial neural network. Let me take a very simple example. You know, if you come from the PD analysis, uh, the, 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 the toy problem is always the Laplacian. Let me take the Laplacian. Um, so minus Laplacian of u plus sigma of u equal to f in omega, u equal to zero on the boundary, right? Uh, this is the solution that we are looking for. We, you need a weak formulation. Weak formulation basically for those who are completely unaware consists in multiplying by test function, integrating in omega, and then what happens, I don't know. All right, it is integrating in omega and then integrating by parts and you end up with a system which is, uh, say, look like this. Uh, we look for u in a suitable functional space, which is h10 in this case, uh, such that a of uv is equal to f of v, a of uv is the integral of gradient of u times gradient of v, plus the integral of sigma times uv, which is what you get from integrating this system, and f of v is the right-hand side. So you start from there. Now, when you solve by finite elements, by high-fidelity model, uh, you basically replicate this at the finite dimensional level. So to skip any detail, you just project this into finite dimensional space of piecewise linear polynomials. And uh, you represent your finite element solution in terms, this is very important, in terms of specific values, uj, and those are the values of selected points. So you represent your finite dimensional solution by, say, a vector of uh, nodal values and you end up with a linear system, a u equal to b, uh, and, and this is a kind of moral uh, conclusion. If you start from a linear partial differential equation, you end up with a linear algebraic system. All right. Um, so uh, this is the summary. u is the sum of uj, phi j, phi j are basis functions, and you can see this as an input-output function that we call finite element method function. You start from x independent variables and you produce u, which are the unknown coefficients, and let me call those parameters or no other values. Now, if you use an ANN, I try to make a comparison or an analogy between finite elements, which are projection methods, and ANN. If you use an ANN, as we have seen before, you use a, a sequence of uh, composition of functions, uh, affine and nonlinear functions. And at the end, you can reproduce the ANN again in the same spirit as uh, the one that you have been using here. ANN depends on X, which are the independent variables, and on W, and those again are parameters. And those parameters are those that uh, characterize the artificial neural network, right? So you have a finite dimensional space here, and you have finite dimensional space here. So you have a kind of uh, strict analogy between the two worlds, right? Um, now, the point is that the subspace is not indeed a linear vector space. You don't have a basis when you use artificial neural network, whereas you have a basis when you use the Galerkin method, the finite element method. So um, the Galerkin method cannot be used to reproduce, to approximate the solution of artificial neural network because of this intrinsic difference. difference. So the idea is to replace the Galerkin method by a collocation method. Just take a few points in the computational domain. And, uh, and then 
you, you minimize, with respect to the parameters of artificial neural networks, the uh, residual of the PDE and the residual of the boundary conditions at those points. The residual of the PDE at those points and the residual of the boundary condition at the boundary point. And please note that this is also suitable when you have incomplete data. Sometimes you do not have all the boundary information that you need to solve your partial differential equations. You might have, might have it only in specific points, right? So uh, this is the way you can um, somehow uh, pursue the analogy between, uh, 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 say, um, artificial neural network and, uh, and finite element method. So this is the pin, uh, physical inform, uh, physics informed neural network, because in, uh, in the previous uh, minimization of the loss function, uh, you take the residual of the PDE and the residual of uh, the boundary conditions. You are informing your neural network by the physical uh, model. So uh, the pro of this approach with respect to the standard finite element approach is a meshless method. You don't need a mesh. Uh, you can implement uh, 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 and reuse machine learning algorithms. Uh, the differential operators can, uh, uh, can, can be easily computed by automatic differentiation. You compute automatic derivatives. And uh, you can use it for defective problems when you don't have enough boundary conditions or initial conditions of or, 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 or right-hand side data. Uh, well, uh, on the negative side, it's nonlinear, even though your PD is linear. It requires the solution of an optimization problem, which is in general very heavy, to train the network. And, uh, and uh, you do not have the magic, uh, say, theory, mathematical theory of partial differential equations. All right. Um, now, let me, before concluding, showing a few other very specific examples on the way you may use this interplay between uh, uh, partial differential equations of high fidelity models and uh, artificial neural networks. Um, uh, you can use multi-fidelity uh, pin. Multi-fidelity pin means that uh, we are, uh, well, first of all, we want to apply it in the case of low data and uh, data with a very high noise, okay? Um, so the, the solution of the partial differential equations can be expressed at, as a sum of a low fidelity guess and a high fidelity correction. And indeed, uh, the weights and biases of the artificial neural network uh, are obtained by, again, a minimization problem. You see where you have uh, here, this is the standard loss function that you have in artificial neural network. You want to minimize with respect to the observation, right? But here you have two other terms, which is, again, the uh, residual of the PDE and the residual on the boundary conditions. Um, now, as you see here, you are using artificial neural network, reduce order models, and partial differential equation. Um, this is the architecture of the network. You start from there, you have, uh, uh, so the, the green box is the one of the multi-fidelity pin. Uh, you start from numerical simulation, we produce uh, uh, synthetic data or synthetic couple of data, di, yi, di are data, yi are the output functions. Uh, we use them to train a neural network of the, uh, say, low fidelity. You get results from the output, from the neural network. You pass it to um, treat the case of noisy measures and use a different neural network to reproduce a high fidelity uh, uh, component that you then pass above to the original solution and you add it up to find the multi-fidelity solution of the original problem. So the PDE solution is expressed as a combination of low fidelity guess and the high fidelity correction. The low fidelity solution acts as an a priori information. The correction is enforced by regularizing the mathematical equation in the loss function, namely by taking into account the PDE and the boundary condition in the loss function. Um, now, uh, this is, uh, I guess, my last example uh, where we try to learn physics by using artificial neural network. We are not learning uh, the equation in an abstract form. We are not learning the Schrodinger equation or the Navier-Stokes equation, say. We are just learning the input-output function uh, for a physical process. 
right? So when you make a different application, you have to start since the beginning, which is somehow less pleasant than having a partial differential equation available all the time, uh, which is invariant in time and space. So we try to compute ANN-based emulators of the physics, build a computation inexpensive surrogate of the high fidelity solver, for instance, the finite element method, which are able to approximate the solution for a given parameter mu. Again, we are talking about solution that depends on parameters, which is very often the case. Parameters can be the coefficients of the uh, elasticity equation in the heart, for instance, or uh, the viscosity of blood, or, uh, uh, or a boundary condition, or, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, so we, uh, we want to learn a dynamical equation namely an ordinary differential equation or an initial boundary value problem. Uh, so we want to, to go beyond a, a static approach. Uh, we want to reduce the computational cost associated with a numerical approximation of uh, micro-scale models, uh, which are high-fidelity models in multi-scale simulations. Um, as you see, the application is to try to reconstruct the active force that is generated in the heart at the microscale level, at the level of every single cell, or cardiomyocyte, say. Uh, we have an ordinary differential equation, a system of ordinary differential equation, with an output G. F is the right-hand side. Right? We want to reconstruct a low-order system. And uh, you see, we are using two artificial neural network to mimic the right-hand side F and the right hand side G here. So the artificial neural network is on the right hand side of the dynamical system. This is what we want to learn. And uh, in this specific case, I was telling you we want to construct the law that is uh, 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 originated at the macro scale level to compute the active force in, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a ventricle, say. Um, we end up with uh, uh, again, as you see, combination between artificial neural network, reduced order models, and high fidelity models, and uh, you end up with uh, a very substantial gain. In this case, you, you have 400 times uh, quicker computational time and, uh, uh, for the force generation at the microscopic level, and on the global system, you, you can uh, reduce your time by a factor of 10, and you have a memory saving uh, uh, which is quite remarkable by two order of magnitude. So there is really a lot of room for, um, for uh, taking advantage of this type of uh, simulations. So let me skip those examples and, uh, and let me conclude with that. Uh, this is a kind of perspective view. Uh, of course, my driving example was uh, uh, about the heart and the heart function. And uh, although I did not have the time to show too many applications, uh, I can tell you that we are, since several years now, collaborating with different medical doctors, with different hospitals to address specific type of problems. Um, so uh, we are not yet ready to deliver solutions which are ready to use, uh, but we are already ready to deliver customized solutions to treat specific pathological issues. But uh, uh, where, where is this uh, domain moving, according to my own perception? First of all, we start from a patient. Um, I've been addressing the issue of the uh, cardiac function, but now you can think of any other pathological uh, uh, problem that may affect a, a, a person. So you start from a patient, and the patient at the clinical level will generate imaging. We generate uh, catheter-based measurements, or, uh, or, or you have... Uh, uh, the clinical uh, history uh, on, uh, for instance, the comorbidities that, uh, that he or she had, right? And those are originated by, by the doctors at the clinical level. Now, uh, with mathematics, with geometry, um, we can generate shapes and, and morphologies. We can compute biomarkers and clinical indicators by using mathematical models or machine learning algorithms. Uh, we can compute the digital twin uh, because of this. Uh, we can compare with uh, the rest of the population. We can feed the database of the global population. Uh, we can feed, we can construct 
a database of virtual population by solving the problem numerically or mathematically. So we can increment the knowledge that we have on the subject. Um, we are indeed coupling together uh, what we learn from physics, what we learn from data, and, uh, and what we learn from statistics on data analysis. Right? So we are really creating an interplay between the mathematical models, which are based on physical principles, machine learning algorithm, and statistics, or data science. We are creating a digital twin with the possibility of uh, providing uh, opportunities to the doctors to improve diagnosis, to find optimal surgery or optimal devices, and uh, to have a better therapy planning. So I, I really believe that we have a very important role to play, and, uh, and luckily we are living a very interesting time where the quote, quote, old physics and all discoveries of the humankind that can be coupled with uh, the extraordinary richness that uh, data science and uh, big data analysis and machine learning algorithms are, uh, are providing to us. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation of such a complex model. But my question is uh, on why uh, you don't try preclinical models with mouses for the check of, the, of this heart modeling, instead of going to the humans that are much more difficult because... Okay, uh, th thank you for the question. Um, well, our goal is to compute uh, uh, the heart function for humans. This is my goal. Uh, and uh, so we are moving from uh, uh, the basic physical principles that are operating the, the human heart. Um, now, needless to say, uh, some of the benchmark are available experimentally on uh, animals. Uh, those are part of the old story. So we are using those type of information uh, to have better representation of what we're doing here, but we, are, we want to customize this for human beings. Uh, of course, you can adapt it to mice, for instance, uh, you, you have to, or to pigs, right? Uh, you have just to account for different type of morphology, uh, different shapes, uh, but the basic principles are the same. So um, I'm not saying that it's the same, exactly the same model, but they are very similar models. And uh, I, I guess that once you have this ready, you can now tailor it for other uh, specific investigation where you also have data. Yeah, my point is basically that with these other animal models, you can test many more parameters directly in LIV that you don't, cannot do with humans. Yeah, so you th can this make is, this much is, better validation. Yeah, this is absolutely correct. Um, well, uh, this calls for the validation. Now, the point is that uh, in human, of course, you don't have all this type of richness. Uh, we have a weaver data, uh, we have experiments, we have measurements, and you try to assimilate this information into the, um, the model by data simulation techniques. Uh, um, uh, it, this is true. This is absolutely true. Um, I mean, I, I, I put myself the bar very high and uh, I want to get there. Uh, but this is not in contradiction with the fact that someone can actually use it for uh, investigating different cases when you have more data. Absolutely. Uh, I have also to say that from a mathematical viewpoint, I'm much more stimulated when you do not have all the data that you need, all the information that you need, because this means that you have to end up with new techniques. For instance, many of the models that we have realized for the, with the artificial neural network, they, they are precisely uh, focused on the uh, a computation of missing data by solving uh, inverse problems or data simulation problems, and this again is a trigger for developing new mathematical models. So it's a, it's a mathematical excitement, right? Uh, 
uh, it could be easier on animals, but I, I wanted to give myself a more ambitious goal. So let's see if I will be successful. Thank you, Alfio, for the, the very nice talk. So first of all, I would like to be sure that uh, you think that this is uh, a before, before and after time. I mean, we are, are we in a situation where something is really changing or, or not? This is my question. Well, I mean, if I have to judge on my own experience, uh, when I started this project, basically this was four years ago, um, I have to confess you that, uh, uh, well, first of all, I didn't have any uh, reasonable knowledge of uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, none of our methods were actually embedding uh, data-driven methods. And today it's very hard to find any single piece of the puzzle which is completely, say, uh, uh, independent of uh, uh, data-driven models. Uh, in a way or another, because you don't need uh, specific parameters or uh, constitutive laws, and so you want uh, to have a boost from experimental analysis, or because you want to reduce the complexity, or because you want to recompute uh, coefficients, or maybe you want to compute the uncertainty quantification the way uncertain values that you have in clinical images, for instance, are going to affect the output. And, and, the output. and since this is a nonlinear iterative process, you need speed up of all the procedures and this speed up is made available by uh, suitable artificial neural networks. So to me the past two years have been really revolutionary in this respect uh, and our, our models and methods and software today uh, look, uh, I, have to, I, I think I do not exaggerate if I say that completely different than uh, the one that you had until three years ago. So for me this is the right time to make the revolution the mathematical revolution. Of course, we're very aware that uh, we are abandoning uh, the, uh, the, 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 the kingdom of, the magic kingdom of PDEs uh, and high fidelity models where you are sitting in a very comfortable zone with a lot of uh, theory uh, and that this is somehow missing uh, in, in those cases. Uh, often it happens that you have algorithms that do not work as you could expect and you don't know why, which is very frustrating for a mathematician. But we have seen yesterday in, uh, in the, the lecture by, by, by Joan Bruna that uh, there's a lot of effort from the mathematical side to understand, to better understand the mathematics behind those networks. Uh, even though, again, they are limited to very specific application, which are, I would say, much narrower than the one that I'm addressing here, but if you have a perspective view, I can speculate and say that in five years we'll tell a completely different story okay. in this building. All right, so you answer my second question also. So <laughs> that's fine, thank you. Hello, thank you very much for the very, very nice talk. Uh, I. I have a question on the time scales. If I understood properly, most of your simulations were very short time scale on the order of seconds. So they give you a picture of how the heart is functioning right now. What do these kind of models might tell you about how the heart might function, say, in a month from now or in a year? Can you simulate also long-term dynamics like uh, fatigue or, or wearing effects of the tissues? Uh, yeah, very good question. Um, uh, yes, but you have to change the approach. Of course, this approach is tailored, they say, on, uh, on the short time scale, on the heartbeat. And just to give an idea, uh, the heartbeat takes place over a, a second, typically one second of real time. So we slice this interval of one second into or the order of 10 to the power 4 uh, sub-intervals, because otherwise we'll not be able to capture the fast dynamics. So uh, this explains why, for simulating a heartbeat, uh, you have to solve this monster equation or partial differential equation that are non-nearly coupled uh, in, a, in a monster time of order of days on a big supercomputer. Um, so uh, why this? Because we want to uh, provide, first of all, a better knowledge of the physiology. We like to help the doctors to better understand their own matter. This is something that you don't find on the medicine books, right? 
not on clinical, neither on clinical images. This is something new. This is a new type of medicine that we are, I mean, that we can create mathematically speaking. Right? So that's the very first thing. And to do that, you, have, you need a very powerful lens. You, you have to go to the very micro details in space and time and see structures that you would not see otherwise, right? In the terms of uh, the cardiac rhythm or the behavior of the, the delta pressure on the valves, which is so important to compute the fatigue, or again, on the vortices that are created during the astolic peak, uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? Now, um, is that useful? Of course, it's useful to better understand the physiology and also the pathology. Can you make predictions, long-term predictions? No, with this type of model, because it's so, sorry, Italians, you know, they use hands. Um, uh, because, because it's so computationally demanding. Uh, however, uh, we use in some cases additional models that are based on average quantities um, or the differential equations to predict the outcome, the development of specific quantities. Um, in that case, you have multi-scale in time, right? So you need to find the right, for instance, you use it to predict the evolution of plaques in the carotid arteries. Um, you have two different scales. The, small, the local scale, where you want to get details, and then you end up with a knowledge that, in, that is exploited by the core scale in time where you need other methods to compute, for instance, remodeling of, of the way the fatigue will, uh, will affect the evolution. So it's a different perspective. Uh, they are not in contradiction. They have to cooperate, but being aware of the fact that you are, again, moving on different time scales. Uh, let me, if you allow me to, again, take the, the, the previous question on the animals versus uh, uh, human beings, because this is uh, that is a very intriguing question indeed. Uh, well, Part of the excitement of this research is not only mathematics, which is the primary excitement, is also the fact that you can dialogue with doctors. I mean, in our department, in our Polytechnic of Milan, we do not have a, a laboratory, we cannot deal with animals, right? So we'll not be able to, to have experimental analysis on animals. So doctors, of course, are primarily interested in uh, pathological behavior of uh, the heart uh, on, on humans. and. Uh, so the second part of the excitement is the possibility of collaborating with them. And I think that uh, working on the human art in this respect is uh, for them more important than working on, uh, on animals. Uh, although, again, uh, the two aspects are very, very important. Welcome. <laughs>